Hello, everyone. You are logged into a webinar on the Universal Child Allowance. We will get started in about two minutes. I'll uh, give everyone an extra minute to, to get logged in. We're still uh, seeing participants, which is great. Talk to you soon. All right, hello again, everyone. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. So all participants are muted. You will be able to hear the presenters. Uh, there's a chat box where you can type in questions. We'll have a question and answer session towards the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will send out slides afterwards. So, good afternoon. My name is Lionel Foster, and I am Communications Director for the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty. The Mobility Partnership is a collaboration of 24 leading voices representing academia, practice, the faith community, philanthropy, and the private sector. Together, these partners are developing a set of actionable ideas to dramatically increase mobility from poverty. The effort is housed at the Urban Institute and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Hiro Katsu Yoshikawa is one of the partners. Hiro is a community and developmental psychologist who studies the effects of policies and programs related to immigration, early childhood development, and poverty reduction on children and youth in the U.S. and in low- and middle-income countries. He co-directs the Global Times for Children Center at New York University, where he is a professor. Today, Hiro will present a proposal that will be described in detail in a paper written with several co-authors including partnership member Catherine Eaton, that will be published in an upcoming issue of the Russell Sage Journal of the Social Sciences. So this is not a mobility partnership proposal. The partnership is developing and refining a slate of recommendations that we will present in the coming months. But today's conversation is very much in keeping with the partnership's mission. It exposes others to the type and quality of ideas the partnership is discussing and gives us an opportunity to consider ideas currently circulating within the field. There's a lot of interest in income supports right now. For example, Y Combinator is planning to pilot a basic income program in California, and the Niskanen Center has a proposal of its own for a universal child allowance. So Hero will present for roughly 30 minutes, and afterwards we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Just remember that chat function. Uh, I'll be uh, taking in your, your questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Hero. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, um, Lionel, and thanks very much for the invitation for this um, to present on this webinar. 
Um, I'm just trying to see where I need to click for forwarding. Um, Hi, here. I just clicked directly on the screen, the picture I of the slide. Uh, I see. Okay. So um, today I'm going to talk. Um, Actually, have a two-part talk. Uh, the first is a proposal for a child allowance to reduce poverty and income instability among children in the United States, and the second um, is a uh, randomized experiment, a uh, proposed experiment and study, um, including some pilot data, um, that really zeroes in on a very specific subgroup that we think is important, which are children in the first three years of life. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators on the research team for the child allowance, um, led by Luke Schaefer of uh, the University of Michigan. You see the other um, authors there in alphabetical order. Um, and then the research team on the project on poverty and early child development, uh, led by uh, Greg Duncan and Kimberly Noble, with um, Catherine Magnuson and Lisa Janetian as collaborators. So um, the context of for this is that child poverty in the United States remains stubbornly high, and um, we do actually currently spend um, quite uh, um, a large amount of government expenditures on cash support for children in the form of both the federal income tax child exemption and a tax credit called the child tax credit. Um, and what's notable uh, for these is that um, uh, although they are not universal, they do um, uh, provide benefits for those with uh, relatively high incomes. For example, a family with two children receives more than $4,000 per year if their annual income is around $100,000, more than $3,000 if their income is um, uh, between about $250,000 and about $400,000, while families with no or very low taxable income actually receive nothing under these um, tax policies. Um, so the uh, rationale for um, our proposal is that a stable source of income could reduce material hardship and improve child health and development. Certainly there are other proposals than um, a universal child allowance that are currently being considered, including reforming the child tax credit to make it fully refundable, um, so it phases in earlier and reaches lower income families. Um, however, we propose a universal monthly uh, child allowance to provide all children with a dependable cash income floor, including the very poorest families in America, including those who cannot work or cannot find uh, work. Um, and uh, I will also be presenting data that focuses on very young children as a particularly important group to consider for such income support. Um, the United States, just to set some historical context, has increased its financial commitment to fighting poverty substantially over the past half century through refundable tax credits and in-kind aid. Um, and more aid is now directed to low-income working families uh, when they are working, um, less aid to families who are unable to maintain stable employment. Um, another background uh, historically is that TANF, um, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, um, which in the uh, mid-1990s when it began was largely devoted to cash assistance, um, only one quarter of TANF dollars currently go towards basic assistance and other uses include a variety of other um, resources like child care subsidies and state uh, earned income tax credits um, with relatively little spent on helping recipients find work. Uh, this um, figure gives a sense of the federal expenditures on major cash and near cash programs for children in billions of dollars, uh, with the top line representing the child tax exemption in federal tax law and the child tax credit, um, with about $38 million billion uh, going towards the exemption, about $58 billion going towards the child tax credit. The EITC just below that, um, the work-based tax credit um, representing about uh, an additional $79 billion. Then you see the figures um, quite a bit smaller for TANF, for SSI, for SNAP or food stamps, and for low-income housing assistance. 
And just to note that uh, currently um, the spending on the child tax exemption and child tax uh, uh, credit uh, really are um, uh, larger than the um, in-kind kinds of uh, contributions and SSI below, uh, represented by the bottom four bars. Uh, where does the United States uh, land in terms of child income poverty um, relative to other rich uh, countries. This is a graph that shows that we are on the high end of child poverty. This is post-tax and transfer income um, with a relative poverty calculated at less than 50% of the national annual median. And so we're really on the high end uh, of this. Um, there are countries with um, some form of a child allowance um, that are listed at the bottom of this uh, slide, um, and we could think of the uh, English-speaking countries like Australia, Canada, Ireland, and the United Kingdom as being countries uh, uh, that um, we look to for particular kinds of comparisons. All four of them provide some form of child allowance. Um, as an example, the United Kingdom offers a universal child benefit, um, uh, which is then taxable for high-income families. So why a monthly child allowance? Um, uh, we believe, based on the existing literature and on the experiences of families uh, trying to make ends meet, that increased income provided in a steadier flow than a once-a-year uh, amount may allow parents to increase investments in their children on a more sustained basis, improve child health and development. Um, and increased income might reduce family and environmental stress, which can themselves improve child health and development. Um, there's also some interesting research um, about how poverty can compromise parents' cognitive bandwidth um, with um, some harmful consequences for decision-making um, uh, in various household uh, decisions. Um, there is also a reason to be concerned about um, monthly and other income instability, which research increasingly shows can harm children's development and learning. Um, and there is substantial intra-year volatility in income and expenses, um, and as well as um, within month volatility uh, in, in these factors. So um, together, these um, findings from the research literature suggest that a form of dependable monthly income support um, could have substantial benefits for um, child development. So we based a uh, universal child allowance proposal on principles. Um, so first of all, um, that uh, there should be a universality aspect to the policy, recognizing that all families in the United States incur substantial expenses when raising children. Um, second, that the allowance should be accessible and of sufficient frequency to meet short-term cash needs, um, and therefore um, a monthly distribution is what we argue for. Um, that the payments should be adequate for a family to address the basic needs of children. And uh, we recommend $250 a month as meeting um, that uh, level from a variety of um, studies um, that look at family expenditure patterns, families um, with uh, uh, children. And uh, additional important considerations include the fact that families with younger children um, may need to be eligible for larger payments in that they incur um, the, a higher burden of raising um, the costs of raising children. These have to do with the uh, much higher costs, for example, of infant and toddler care uh, relative to um, the supports later on that children experience, like K-12 schooling. Um, we also recognize that per-child payments should perhaps decline with additional children, and that is built into our cost estimates. Um, we have three proposed versions of a child allowance here, a simple one, um, which is monthly payments of $250 per child per month for all children under the age of 18, a tiered one, um, which distinguishes by child age with a slightly higher uh, payment of $300 per um, child for kids who are in early childhood under the age of six, 
Um, and then a version of that is that is equivalized that takes into account uh, a bit of the economies of scale as additional children um, are in a household that they might not require exactly that same amount um, uh, for each additional child. Um, so uh, these would uh, reduce the benefit levels as the number of children in the household increases. Um, in each of these three cases, we propose taxing the payments at the marginal tax rate of the unit claiming the child. So in simulations, um, uh, conducted by members of our team on the CPS ASEC data, um, the current population survey. Uh, we find that with our um, proposal, uh, child poverty would fall dramatically um, uh, with a universal uh, child allowance. Um, and that uh, families in extreme poverty, which our um, collaborator Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer um, have uh, outlined in their recent uh, book would be virtually eliminated and um, poverty and deep poverty would decline by substantial amounts. Um, this is also true if we turn to young child poverty, um, the poverty levels of children in early childhood. What about the cost? Um, a context for this, again, is that the current child exemption and the child tax credit um, are uh, have a combined cost of about $96 billion uh, per year in calculations from the Tax Policy Center. And um, the tiered and equivalized uh, child allowance uh, would represent an additional net cost of about $69 billion uh, a year. Um, turning to the second uh, point, which really gets to a uh, critical gap in our knowledge, um, this is um, a study, a large study that is currently in the planning for which a pilot study has been completed, testing the impact of cash income in the first three years of life. Um, the science to policy need here is that um, uh, although there is a evidence base that strongly suggests overall the benefits of income support um, for children and particularly for young children, there's a critical gap in causal evidence and experimental evidence for the very youngest children um, in the first three years of life. Um, and so um, our study is um, uh, based on these questions of what is the magnitude of um, cash transfers during the very first years of life, a period of the most rapid and foundational growth in brain architecture? What are the mechanisms by which income might impact the earliest years of child development? Um, I apologize if you hear a siren that's New York City outside my office. Um, and uh, does such an effect exist on biological and neurological processes in addition to children's development and learning uh, of other types? So uh, uh, what I and my collaborators have proposed would be the first um, uh, large-scale experiment uh, for low-income mothers uh, in four proposed sites in which a treatment condition would receive $333 a month uh, for 40 months, a uh, control condition would receive $20 a month for 40 months with that payment um, provided on an electronic debit card on a monthly basis. So um, the uh, part of this um, monthly payment rationale, again, is that uh, there are um, quite a lot of studies showing the challenges of meeting monthly consumption needs among low-income families uh, with a additional high frequency of intra-year um, income instability and um, increasing evidence that that form of income instability uh, above and beyond the average level of income um, can hurt children's uh, particularly early development and learning. Um, our debit card based approach includes a text reminder on the day of the child's birth date um, so that the payments uh, would start at the birth of the uh, child. 
Um, and uh, within the study, uh, this would actually create another source of random variation within the month that could be compared, for example, to the timing of monthly um, uh, benefits such as SNAP or um, other monthly uh, benefits that a family might be receiving. Um, we um, hypothesized two pathways, an investment pathway and a stress pathway that might affect child cognitive, socio-emotional, and brain development. Um, with the investment pathway uh, involving families being better able to meet basic needs, um, a higher quality of non-parental care, which is a critical um, developmental factor in the first years of life, potentially improved housing and neighborhood um, uh, uh, conditions for the household and more parental time with the child, all of which have been linked to more stimulating um, parent-child learning activities. Um, the other major pathway is a stress pathway model in which um, families becoming better able to meet ba basic needs should um, experience less stress, um, better mental health, more cognitive bandwidth for decision making, um, higher quality parenting, more stability in the home, um, and potentially um, better healthcare utilization in the first years of, child, of the child's life. Together, these pathways would improve um, children's cognitive development, their social and emotional uh, development, um, and potentially better physical health as well. Um, I think I'm not going to go into this detail around the data collection. Um, uh, we will be sharing the slides. Um, I did want to share a little bit on our initial findings from a pilot experiment, a very small scale one with uh, 30 um, uh, low income uh, mothers below the poverty line uh, recruited in 2004. Uh, we tested essentially the feasibility of the um, uh, cash transfer and so we didn't include the full amount but had a 100 month $100 a month condition and a $20 a month control condition. And we collected qualitative and quantitative data um, in the first 12 months um, to see whether uh, it was feasible to um, provide a cash transfer through a debit card um, at this particularly um, uh, often stressful time of life, the very first year um, of newborns and toddlers lives. Um, so this was conducted in New York City uh, with a uh, uh, largely black and Latino um, sample. Um, and uh, we did find, even with a very small sample, that on baseline characteristics, um, random assignment um, uh, did seem to work in that there was no particular directional pattern of the baseline characteristics across um, the $100 a month condition and the $20 a month condition. Um, uh, this I'll skip over. We retain most of this small sample. Um, all participants did use the card within one month of recruitment. Uh, funds were typically spent within two weeks, and there were relatively few documented problems among 1,112 transactions on the debit card. Um, not surprisingly, there was a very strong monthly pattern of uh, transactions um, across both the intervention or $100 a month group in green and the control group or $20 a month uh, group in red here. Um, and uh, although uh, a large chunk were um, withdrawn at ATMs, this is a uh, analysis um, by transaction type um, for the 1,112 transactions with the intervention in blue and the uh, control group in uh, red. Uh, reassuringly, there were only three transactions that occurred at a liquor store. And um, that is in line with several recent studies um, in the United States, um, in the UK, and elsewhere showing that unconditional cash transfers um, uh, in uh, with the intent of um, being essentially a child allowance are generally not spent on uh, vices, things like alcohol or drugs. There is um, no evidence supporting that those kinds of expenses um, increase as a result of unconditional cash transfers to families with children. Um, this is very preliminary, um, but our, uh, we did look at one year at um, uh, 
the kinds of family processes that we believe are related to positive very early child development, and we do find that factors such as center-based child care use, child care expenditures, um, expenditures on children, mother-child activities, um, which are cognitively stimulating activities, um, all increased, and parenting stress and um, reported household chaos and instability all decreased. Of course, that's all very preliminary. Um, there were notes of helpfulness from the qualitative uh, interviews um, that these uh, uh, quotes reflect here. Um, there was largely a perception that these payments were for the baby, quote unquote, um, and uh, there was some evidence of saving within the month for the time when money is especially low. Um, so, for example, the day or two before payday, as in the second quote here. So, to finish, wait, I need to go back. Um, how do I go back? You can just use the oh, back there. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yep, yep, yep. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, through the child tax exemption and child tax credit, again, our nation already recognizes a societal benefit to supporting parents in raising uh, children. Um, but our biggest policies um, exclude the lowest income families and uh, we believe are not equitable. Um, principles of stable cash income flow for all families, um, including those who don't receive benefits from the CTC, the child tax credit, um, and the tax exemption, we believe are met by a universal child allowance. Um, uh, this would complement, uh, not replace our work-based safety net and would dramatically reduce child poverty. Uh, we believe there's also a strong rationale for higher levels of support in early childhood when the costs of raising children are particularly high and their brain architecture is particularly sensitive to environmental influence. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the funders of this work, um, the two sets uh, that have supported the child allowance proposal and the um, cash income in the first three years of life uh, project. Um, and uh, that is it. I think we're going to turn to Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hiro. Uh, just another reminder for all of our participants, some of you have sent questions in already, and thank you for those. And everyone else, you're welcome to submit questions as well. So I have a, a few in front of me already. Uh, first question for you, Hiro, why make this universal? So you, you make the argument that too many of our uh, income supports for children go to families uh, that do not have the lowest incomes. Um, but why universal? Because you can imagine that families with the highest incomes, this might make no difference at all for them, their spending behavior or, or what they would, would spend on their children. So at I, I first, I, I guess my question is, would you agree with that assessment? And if so, you know, why universal? Um, so I think our group felt that um, it was uh, – a universal challenge in terms of raising uh, children in the United States, in fact, in all countries, and that uh, the principle of um, support for raising children um, uh, was a universal one uh, in, in terms of its uh, concept, in terms of um, uh, this recognition of the cost of raising children. Um, as I said, this would be taxed at the unit of um, uh, the household. And so um, essentially the wealthiest households would be helping to subsidize the poorer uh, families who would, uh, of course, receive proportionally a larger uh, amount of the um, uh, allowance in terms of uh, their own incomes. Um, so that's our current um, proposal. Um, there are certainly alternatives um, such as um, raising that tax uh, level um, for the wealthiest families that could be considered. So we do um, uh, welcome feedback around the details of those kinds of aspects of um, 
our proposal. Thanks. Another question for you, Hero. Um, one participant asks, um, says there, there are likely to be arguments that um, and a support like this could be a disincentive for parents to work. Um, so has your group considered that and, and what, do you, what do you think what do you think of that um, potential outcome? Um, so um, uh, that's something that we have, um, I believe, yet to conduct uh, simulations on. Um, and so I don't uh, believe we have a lot of um, strong evidence one way or the other on the degree to which this would be a disincentive to work or um, in some cases um, Potentially, you know, there are some arguments that could be made for um, uh, how this could um, uh, free up uh, things like uh, the costs of raising kids uh, early in their development to help enable work. Um, things like the increases in childcare expenses that we saw um, in our uh, pilot study indicate that those um, are, are meeting, and certainly from these parents' perspective, um, the costs of childcare are prohibitive um, in the first year or two of life for many low-income families, uh, and that, that could um, conceivably for that group actually ease transitions um, into work or increases in work effort. Got it. Um, one Listener asked if we will send the slides uh, after the presentation. The answer is absolutely. Thanks for that. And an, another question, Hero, how did you arrive or your group arrive at the $250 per month uh, income support level? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that was partly driven by um, a set of the um, existing causal evidence. For example, the welfare to work experiments of the uh, 1990s that showed the amount of um, income that could make a detectable difference in children's academic achievement, for example. Um, there is also um, a small set of expenditure, household expenditure studies that have tried to look at um, child expenditures and their role in uh, being able to make ends meet. Um, then I think there is the recent evidence on um, the the poorest families uh, in America from uh, Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer's book, Two Dollars a Day, um, that suggests a kind of um, uh, minimum uh, floor for families to really be able to have any kind of sustainability in their household um, functioning as well as their uh, children's well-being. Thank you. Another question. Have you considered that counting the allowance as income would affect the family's eligibility for programs like child care and SNAP? Yes. We, um, at this moment, the proposal um, would um, uh, not have that count um, against those other benefits. We don't think it's appropriate to think of this as a replacement uh, um, for those programs. Okay, I'm looking up other questions now. One moment. Um, I, you mentioned this throughout your presentation, so providing this income support could have a, a number of knock-on benefits, especially with respect to health. Um, I'm wondering, is your group thinking about, or have you already tried to measure the, the size of that effect, for example, um, the knock on effects on health, and how far do you think you can go with that? Because you could, you might even think of, um, you know, this proposal's effect on a number of expenditures across different systems. So, so yeah, how, how far do you want to take that? Uh, yes, I, we, we think for, uh, I think this question refers to the zero to three study, um, and we do plan to um, gather information on, uh, certainly I mentioned healthcare utilization on um, uh, basic indicators of child health, um, 
and uh, understand as well the consequences for um, use of other benefits um, for uh, related issues like housing stability, um, uh, for family planning. Um, the zero to three period involves a very complex set of family decisions, and so, uh, you know, including ones as varied as family planning versus childcare um, uh, uh, versus um, housing um, and neighborhood uh, choice and moves and those kinds of things. So those are uh, quite a broad set of uh, issues that we believe are worth looking into and which we plan to um, assess. Great. Uh, what is the argument for a supplemental transfer versus, say, rolling existing programs like SNAP and TANF into a cash transfer? Um, well, we think um, the current safety net is simply not adequate um, to address issues of child poverty in the United States. Um, you can look at this as, at a comparative um, perspective, as I showed in the graph across um, quite a few of the OECD countries. Um, and you can also look at it in terms of our achieved um, early childhood outcomes um, and the disparities that we see in children's early learning, for example, that show up as early as the second year of life. So we have a situation here where um, we think that um, we, the strengthening of the safety net is something that um, is evidence-based um, that uh, in this case uh, addresses the needs of families that, um, that currently are not, again, being served by the existing tax exemption and child tax credit, uh, the families at the very lowest end, for example, of the income uh, distribution and those who are unable to find work. So. Um, so we think these other supports are important. Um, they are not enough by themselves um, to address the issues around uh, children's development and learning and ultimately their social mobility. Their um, chances of escaping poverty um, as a chronic condition that affects their entire childhoods. We have plenty of evidence on the long-term harm to um, children's future earnings, their employment, their health, um, their productivity, um, and therefore um, their cost to society of not uh, building in um, serious efforts to reduce child poverty um, starting at birth. Thank you. We have a number of questions asking um, some version of a question about feasibility. Uh, first, given the, the income administration, what do you think the prospects are for a proposal like this? Uh, so that's at the federal level. And uh, is this the kind of pro project or program that states can pilot, um, for example, in the absence of federal action? So if you could maybe talk out loud about how you and your collaborators are, are thinking about feasibility, especially working in partnership with government at different levels. Certainly. So. Um... So first of all, we think um, a, a focus on child poverty and supporting families is a bipartisan issue, um, and it was um, during the campaign, and uh, issues such as paid leave uh, came up um, from our uh, president-elect. Uh, there was a quite robust um, conversations and discussions um, in both parties around issues such as reforming the child tax credit um, and addressing issues in its uh, distribution. Um, so we think this is part of a, certainly a larger conversation than this PowerPoint presented about um, income support to families raising children in the 
United States and providing um, economic supports that recognize families' um, strengths and commitments in raising children, um, but the, the inadequacy of um, current supports in reducing child poverty um, to levels uh, that we would really um, like them reduced to. Um, we know that the tax policy system can put a dent in child poverty. Uh, we don't think it's large enough, um, and we do think that's a bipartisan issue. And then, yes, at the state level, these are the general concept of how to address income support um, the principles uh, that we believe are um, in our proposal and are based on um, several relevant research literatures and sets of research studies, um, which uh, we cite in the paper that uh, supports uh, the child allowance proposal, um, uh, that those are strong rationales also at the state and local levels to provide greater uh, income support to families with children, um, include that rationale that the uh, families with young children uh, may need some extra uh, support. Thanks. So uh, Joel Dodge asks, what is the timeline for the larger four-city study based on the New York City pilot? Uh, when would that begin and conclude? Uh, we're um, in um, wrapping up the fundraising uh, pieces of this. Um, if uh, anyone's interested in supporting funding, that would be great. <laughs> uh, but our current plan is to start um, the project next summer. And we do believe, I should have mentioned this, that that study would inform um, a variety of um, uh, income support and economic, uh, family economic policies in the United States, that we really need an accurate estimate of um, how much uh, income matters for children's development in these first uh, three years of life. Of course, um, uh, at the end of that uh, period, we would plan to keep following up the kids, but um, the, the initial plan is to uh, um, focus on the first three years of life. Great. Uh, Samuel Hammond asks, is Hero familiar with Scott Winship's research finding that child poverty rates are at historical lows when one properly accounts for existing transfers? Um, so uh, our paper looks at the effects um, and considers kind of post um, tax and transfer uh, rates, but um, we're certainly happy to look at um, Scott's uh, estimates and uh, uh, run these uh, simulations that have been run, um, taking those into account. Okay, I have a question from Teresa Anderson. Would this potentially have effects on the cost of care in the child care market? Or similarly, could this be used by the government as a reason not to expand subsidies for child care? In other words, could this reduce the availability of child care either through increased cost or reduce subsidy availability? Um, we would uh, um, hope that that's not the case. I don't know if we have data from uh, the United States on that point. Um, uh, but we are not proposing this, again, as a replacement for in-kind supports. Um, currently, child care subsidies are reaching um, a minority of the low-income families that are potentially eligible for them. Uh, so um, it's not clear whether our simulations could extend all the way out to the effects on child care markets, but that's a, that's a good question. Um, what do you think are the likely effects of this income supplement on marriage and separation? Um, that's a, also a very interesting question. The uh, welfare to work uh, demonstrations in the um, mid-90s showed 
um, evidence in a couple studies um, that for um, mothers who uh, were never married at the outset of the intervention, an income support um, focused uh, make work pay kind of program actually increased marriage rates among the never married moms. Um, that was true, for example, in the New Hope um, experimental demonstration um, at both two and five year follow ups. So um, that's an interesting question um, uh, as to whether that would hold within the context of this form of uh, um, cash transfer. But that's what the income support policies um, uh, from the 1990s, but again, a couple of those studies showed. And the qualitative data, for example, from that New Hope study suggested that um, low-income moms were uh, saying that increased economic stability um, and increased economic self-sufficiency for themselves would make them feel more ready for marriage. Um, and I believe similar kinds of findings were found by um, uh, Kathy Eden, Christina Gibson, Davis, and colleagues at that point. Great. All right, another question uh, from a participant. Are you partnering with local organizations in order to execute the next round of uh, pilots in the four cities you mentioned? Uh, so the recruitment, of course, is in um, uh, at birth on maternity wards of um, hospitals, of public hospitals. Um, the uh, partnering um, that we were most concerned about was um, a kind of financial services company that would provide the debit cards and text messages and reminders and those kinds of things. So, um, uh, but beyond that, um, uh, uh, we were not going to test an additional services kind of intervention that might involve actual service provision through partnerships with community-based organizations or those kinds of things because we felt it was important to test the pure uh, effect of uh, a cash transfer rather than that combined with um, uh, any variety of services. Um, so. Uh, we do believe that, for example, that parenting supports are very important um, in early childhood. Um, there are and continue to be many evaluations of those, but that it was uh, important and striking um, that uh, there has not been a single experimental test of a cash transfer in the very first three years of life uh, in comparison to the many evaluations of programs that have focused on um, parenting, for example. Great. Uh, I have a question here. I'm trying to parse it a bit. I think the gist of the question is, um, do you need even more of a support for the, the youngest kids than you currently have, uh, considering the, the very high cost of taking care of infants and toddlers? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I, so we certainly proposed something that we felt was um, uh, feasible um, to propose from a policy perspective, and uh, we were, to some extent, thinking about the different scenarios of, uh, of costs. We don't think this could take the place of the idea of a um, comprehensive early childhood development policy that goes from prenatal to school entry, and that is something that is still an enormous challenge uh, for the uh, United States, for states and um, localities. Um, A.J. Chaudhry, Tara Morrissey, Christina Weiland, and I have a book coming out um, uh, next year on that topic uh, of um, uh, what a comprehensive early childhood care and uh, education approach uh, looks like based on the current evidence. Um, so uh, we don't think this by itself could take the place of um, uh, health 
um, early care and education kinds of policies to support the learning and development of children. At the same time, we think that um, poverty reduction and income support policies are a critical piece of policies to support children's development um, worldwide. Um, poverty reduction is considered an, an important pillar of um, supports for um, families at the societal level. And um, as my slide showed, um, uh, and certainly uh, Jane Waldfogel on our team has done a, a tremendous amount of work on this, comparing um, uh, countries, especially across the OECD countries, in their support of um, poverty reduction, reducing child poverty through things like a child allowance. Another question. Uh, in the case where couples with a child under three are divorced, would this payment need to be split between both parents if the custody arrangement were 50-50? And so uh, thank you. This qu that question is from Holly Stacy, And I, I would add that um, I imagine the same question applies even if the the parents are not married. There's the issue of the maybe custodial versus non-custodial parent. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think our um, uh, assumption has been the custodial parent, but um, uh, I'm not sure uh, we as a group have talked about the kinds of situations that are, for example, split custody. Um, so uh, that's a that's a great point for us to consider. Thanks. Well, thank you all. We've been able to get through quite a few of the questions, and uh, thank you, Hero, for making yourself available and for discussing this with us. Uh, just a quick reminder: uh, a few of you asked throughout. Absolutely, we will send uh, Hero slides uh, and and a recording of the webinar uh, not long after we conclude. And I will, um, sadly, I cannot talk very well and type at the same time, but in just a moment, I will send you all through the chat function a link to the Mobility Partnerships website, mobilitypartnership.org. There you can see the partnership's latest work. We have links to um, pages for each of the partners with information about their expertise, um, and I would also very much encourage you to sign up for the Partnership Post, the U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty's uh, monthly e-newsletter, um, where you can find out about events like this and, and stay informed with uh, the latest in what we're thinking and developing. So thank you all so much, and you'll get a note from us with, the, um, with Hero Slides and a, and a recording in, in just a bit. Thank you.